is ready for the weekend, but it's not here yet. We still have another day of work, but we're going to have some fun for this next hour or so. So my name is Tim Cote. Um, I head up this uh, regulatory affairs group called Only Orphans Cote. Uh, and today is our third in a series of um, week, a monthly seminar, not weekly, monthly seminars on orphan drug regulatory affairs. So this one uh, is called Perk Up for Perts. It's part one. Uh, and it's about the breakthrough therapy designation uh, application and the priority review vouchers. So we're going to hear all about that. And regulatory affairs does not need to be deadly boring. We are going to have some fun with this. Okay, so who is Tim Cote? That's me. I'm a physician. I spent most of my career working for the government. And my last job, I was in charge of the orphanage at the FDA. I signed off on like 1,400 orphan designations. I saw 200 little orphans go to full market approval. And, um, and it was major fun. I left all good federales eventually retire about uh, nine years ago, 10 years, nine years ago, I think it was. And I started a consultancy to my utter astonishment. It exploded and got really big. I had like 38 PhDs working for me. We had 450 clients and I sold it to IQVIA for a tidy sum. So that was nice uh, for a guy from the government, that's for sure. So, but it began a four year non-compete period. So for the last four years, I have been tending my tomatoes in the backyard and not doing much else except raising a little orphan of myself that I won't talk about right now, a little orphan drug that is. Um, but um, three months ago that stopped, so I'm back and we are start, we started this seminar series as part of uh, Part of the fun. So what is a series? We're doing it every month. Um, for the previous months, we started off with, uh, and we have these on tape. So if you want to watch them, go ahead. The first one is on uh, the orphan designation. The guy who signed off on 1400 might know a little bit about them. The second one is on the, the pre-IND meeting and meetings in general, a lot of flavor for what an FDA meeting is all about, and particularly a pre-IND meeting. And that was fun. That was what we did last month. This month, of course, we're doing the, the PRV and, the, uh, and the, BT, uh, the, the priority review voucher and the breakthrough therapy designation. Next month, next month we're going to do part two of Perk Up for Perks. So perks are, you know, um, cool, good things that you can get. They're not really directly on the trail to marketing authorization, but they're extra bonus things along the way. So this time it's uh, the priority review voucher, the breakthrough therapy designation. Next month, it, next month it's going to be accelerated approval, and we'll talk about fast track. So those will be our two topics for next month. Um, why are we doing this? Because it can be fun and because it's useful. It's enter edutainment. So I am not advertising here. My objective is to give you everything I know so you can all do this yourself and you probably won't want to. So you'll still call me, but uh, that's okay. Either way, I, I just want to spread the knowledge and have some fun while we're doing it. So with that, this is a percolator. We don't use them too much anymore. Um, I have a French press myself, and I don't see them anymore. I think there's something that people purists don't like about running coffee that's already coffee through the uh, through the grounds a second time. At any rate, so the perks uh, that we're going to talk about today, I was going to do all four of these. If you got the initial announcement, you thought I was going to talk about accelerated approval fast track. I was, but there's just too much to talk about. So I cut it down and we'll save that for next month. The breakthrough therapy designation and the priority review vouchers both made their appearance in law as part of these large omnibus bills that go through Congress. So they're one little section in larger, big um, packages of multiple different things. That's sort of how they do it. They, they uh, Congress, in its infinite wisdom, uh, collects these things in a little train and moves them along all as one. So breakthrough therapy designation we'll talk about. They were, both of these are about 10, between 10 years or something like that, 10, between uh, 15 years ago and let's say eight years ago, all these legislations came through. The priority review vouchers actually came in three separate pieces of legislation, but they all share the feature of being a priority review voucher. And we'll talk about the very twisted way in which these things incentivize um, the creation of new products for the kinds of drugs that nobody really cares about, doesn't want to do anything with, but we as a society really want to have. So tropical diseases, uh, pediatric rare diseases, and um, medical countermeasures. That's like, uh, you know, some uh, wacko person has some bioterrorism activity and you develop a drug against that bioterrorism activity. So we'll talk about all of that. Okay. What I'm going to tell you about is how to do things practically. That is, uh, that is opinion, that is style, that is 
practicality. This is scripture, okay? This, this is the holy word of FDA with its guidance for industry. Now, do remember that FDA's guidance does not bear, since we have a lawyer in the room, does not bear the weight of law. It is just our best thinking at this time, even though they need to get it through all different kinds of clearances. Um, you are foolish to ignore their best thinking. Okay, you definitely want to read this. This is where this particular guidance, Expedited Programs for Serious and Conditions, uh, Drugs and Biologics, from um, 2014 and it, its updates, actually it's been made its final draft at this point, I believe, um, describe all of these programs uh, for these perks, as we will, for getting things through. Do read this, it is extremely dry, but um, you should always go back to this as the official authoritative source. All right, let's start off with um, the breakthrough therapy designation. This was an invention of Congress. This was not an idea that came out of the FDA. Congress thought to itself, gee, how can we, you know, Congress is pretty close in with the industry. And so, and, and so there's a lot of lobbying activity that's going on. And people are always trying to come up with new initiatives for ways that we could create new interest in new drugs and move things forward faster and better and all that. And the breakthrough therapy designation is sort of like a gold star. Any of you go to, you know, in American high schools, I don't know if they do this anymore, but it used to be back when I was a first grader, because I was a first grader one time, and the teacher would always say, you know, Timmy, you get a little gold star today for this. And they'd put it on the little chart, and maybe you feel so good. Well, that's kind of what breakthrough therapy designation is all about, for you and your drug. Um, so the law was section 902, July 9th, 2021 of FDEJA. FDEJA is the F uh, Food and Drug Administration Safety and, oops, I'm forgetting it now. I knew this, I said it three times today. Say, somebody, somebody remind me, Scott, you'll come up with it, right? Safety and Innovation Act, was it? What was it? At any rate, from, uh, from back in 2012. Also, however, when you're looking at this, when you're looking at the statute, go to the map. You all know what the map is? That's the, um, the Manual of Policies and Procedures out of CEDAR, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, um, 6025.5. They've actually published these out. This is how the FDA itself internally sets its policies and they're very transparent about how they handle breakthrough therapy and then they have maps for practically everything else that you might possibly wanna do at the FDA. So look at the maps, don't forget about the maps. The maps of course also have no weight of law just like the, um, just like the, uh, the guidances. But again, you're foolish to ignore it. It's the reality of the world that we live in. So you wanna know how these things work. Um, okay. To get breakthrough therapy designation, you've got to have at least a whiff of clinical efficacy. You have to have taken your drug, put it into some human beings and said, whoa, Lazarus arises from the dead. I mean, this is great stuff, something amazing. You gotta have some sort of sense that people are doing really well. Um, of all of the things that we ever do, I keep thinking of myself as a regulator, um, so I keep calling it we, but all the things that now they do in the hallowed halls of White Oak, in Silver Spring, Maryland, at the campus of the FDA, this is probably the single most subjective regulatory decision that is ever made. Other regulatory decisions like fast track, like accelerated approval, like um, you know, orphan designation, all of those ones, they have criteria. These have fluffy criteria that really aren't, um, you can't pin them down. It's a breakthrough if the regulator got up on the right side of the bed and decided it was a breakthrough, okay? I know people won't like that, but it doesn't change the reality that it is extraordinarily um, subjective. Getting breakthrough therapy designation is not required. This is a perk. This is not on the pathway to getting your market approval. This is something that can help you though, and I'll explain to you why it's worth it. Not necessarily for the official regulatory benefits, although they're codified in law, the language is so exquisitely vague that you won't, you know, can't really get your arms around it. But in the marketplace, ah, there it's another matter. You wanna get breakthrough therapy designation if you can. And if you don't apply, your chances of getting it are zero. You won't get it. You have to apply to get it, okay? So that's breakthrough therapy designation. This has been a pretty successful program. People are happy about it. Came in in 2012, 
this is up to 2019. It's grown a little bit. The pandemic didn't help much for anybody for anything. But you can see that here's granted, here's denied, and here's withdrawn. And I assure you, people who had it withdrawn, they didn't have it withdrawn because they were on the verge of getting it. They withdrew it because it, it wasn't going to happen. Nevertheless, you can see about a third of the people who've applied for breakthrough therapy designation have actually gone on and gotten it. All right, this is from the statute itself, and I've highlighted some serious, some, uh, some bold, emboldened some words. This is breakthrough therapy designation. A breakthrough therapy drug is intended for alone or in combination with one or more other drugs, so you can have it with other things too, to treat a serious or life-threatening disease or condition. So you got to demonstrate in your application, this is serious. Like, this is serious. Now, any disease I have is serious. I, I count it serious. But you have, and probably almost all of them will be, but it's part of the criteria, and you have to, in your application, demonstrate that it's serious. I can't think of too many drugs, that, too many drugs for diseases that aren't serious, but you've got to go through the motions and show that. Disease or condition and preliminary clinical evidence. Now, that's important, okay? I'm not talking about you've done your studies, you got your pivotal trial done, the data are overwhelming, let's go get breakthrough therapy designation. No, that's not going to work. You're already there. You're at the end point. This is supposed to help you in the beginning, not at the end. So you need preliminary clinical evidence. It is all clinical too, okay? Don't go there with your data on your mice and your rats because that's not going to help. Um, that indicates that the drug may demonstrate substantial improvements over existing therapies. Now, there may be no, what's existing and what's not existing, by the way, is defined by FDA as what is approved for it. So if stuff is used off-label, that's not going to count. But it improvement over existing therapies. And, and you need to have that. By the way, my little orphan that I tried to raise myself, I am trying, I am raising still, actually, uh, an orphan drug for Bichette's disease. We applied, and at the time that we applied for breakthrough therapy designation, another product secured marketing authorization um, while our application was under consideration. And because we didn't have comparison to that new drug, which now was an existing therapy, um, we were denied it at that point. So you have to, if there's other therapies that are out there, you have to demonstrate, hey, we're we're better in this way or that way. And often you can, or you probably wouldn't be doing this. Improvement over existing therapies on one or more clinically significant endpoints. So you got to come in there with some data on what matters to human beings. Not my little molecule shows this and my molecule shows that. It's not about laboratory tests. It's about people dying, hospitalizations, you know, uh, remissions of disease, things like that. Such uh, as substantial treatment effects observed early in clinical development. Again, reaffirm, this is a gold star system that is to help you incentivize early development, help you get through, you know, through the school there. All right, so that's what the definition is. That's what you're writing for when you're trying to get this designation. So what does the law say that you get? Well, number one, which is tangible, is you get all the benefits of fast track. Now, fast track is an administrative process. We're going to talk about that in our next session. I'm not going to get derailed here on what fast track is. But if you get breakthrough therapy designation, hey, you're, you're a fast tracker. You don't have to make a separate application for fast track. You've, you've got fast track. Um, and then the language has lots of vague language that arguably the FDA is already providing to everybody. But they make it sound very flowery and very nice. So I, I commend it to you to go ahead and read interdisciplinary meetings, intensive guidance. Like the guidance that you get already is not intensive. It's sort of superfluous. I don't think so. I mean, it's intensive guidance. Um, and access to higher level managers. But they never define that, you know, the normal managers you get is this one. And the, if you have breakthrough, you get that one. It's not really defined. It's squishy. It's super squishy. So in summary, what FDA is saying, you get breakthrough therapy designation, you're gonna get some extra love, okay? You're gonna get some FDA. Who doesn't want FDA love? We all want FDA love, right? So, um, so it's a good thing. The language is all to the plus, but there's nothing really tangible there. Show me the money, you're not gonna see it. But here's where you're gonna see the money. So here's where you're gonna see the money is in the real world because it is known, the statistics are that products that get breakthrough therapy designation have a much faster track to approval time. It's reduced by like 2.5 to 3.5 years. 
that's a lot. That's some real coin, okay? And there's significant increase in the valuation of the companies that get breakthrough therapy designation. This is the real world stuff. So guess what? Our senators and congressmen, despite the fact that they often are misguided, in this particular instance with the creation of the breakthrough therapy designation, did a good job. Um, the takeover typically increased for these companies. So you regulatory affairs uh, professional working very hard on your breakthrough therapy designation, you may be working yourself out of a job as your company gets gobbled up by somebody else. But that's okay. We all work for the greater good and we hope that it all works out. So the short answer is in the real world, you get a lot. And these charts show it, okay? You can see that um, there are two different uh, charts. Both of them say the same message. One is with uh, all comers and the other one's without uh, accelerated approval or orphan status. But you can see, compare these two charts and you'll see that the breakthrough therapy designation 11 in this setting, and this was a little bit older. This is from uh, Theodore Zucchi from uh, Seeking Alpha. And I commend that to you. You can see it up on the, on the web if you like. The time periods are quite a bit longer for uh, approval times, for uh, um, development times, and for total time overall. So you save two and a half to three years, something like that. And, and that's, a, that's a lot. That means a lot to, uh, to, to everybody. So um, how do you write this thing? Let's get a little practical. And then we're going to take some questions, hopefully. Oh, by the way, Dr. Freeman back there is gathering all my questions together and he's going to relay them to me. I'll restate them and we'll try to answer them when we take a break in just a moment. When you write this thing, focus on the criteria. It's early clinical development. Talk about why your drug is so cool. Remember, it's a breakthrough. It's a breakthrough because it's really cool. It's a breakthrough. Look at what they did. You better be excited about this because <laughs> you got to get them excited about it. Um, you want to compare to what's out there right now. Okay. What's out there right now, you have to have a comparison to what's there. Remember, brevity is the soul of wit. I think that Shakespeare said that. It wasn't mine. But you don't want to throw in a huge tome of paper to these people. They're overworked already, and they're not going to like you more if you send them 100 pages. Okay, Send them something crystalline, something cogent, something that just sums up your data on these two, the early clinical data in comparison to what's out there, and say, this is a breakthrough. Just can, you need a convincing argument. Except though, except the fact that, look, as I mentioned, this is the most subjective thing that FDA ever deals with. So it's a subjective judgment. Lower your standards for applying because if you don't apply, you're not gonna get it. But if you do apply, you might get it in spite of yourself. You might be surprised at this and it's worth it, right? And not getting it doesn't mean that your baby is ugly, okay? If you don't get it, don't be crestfallen about it. One of the problems we have in regulatory affairs is that, you know, I'm sitting here in Kendall Square. This is competitive as hell. Those people out there are ferocious, okay? And I've applied to the FDA and I got dinged on it. It makes you feel bad. And your CEO might not like that. But you have to recognize, prepare them for the fact that this is not a decision that's going to be made on the merits of hard criteria. It's going to be made on some subjectivity. The good news is the review is fast. Congress in its infinite wisdom said, FDA, thou hast only 60 days to reply. You must give an answer. If they don't, they break the law. So FDA pretty much likes to follow the law for the most part, and you will get an answer pretty fast from the time you send it in 60 days. That's a pretty quick turnaround. So go ahead and do it. That is breakthrough. Oh, we're not done yet. One last comment before we leave breakthrough and go on to the priority review voucher. The medicine, excuse me, the Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy designation, or RMAT for short, I should have put out the abbreviation. Everybody calls it RMAT because it's just too much uh, to say. Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy designation. This, you know, CBER, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, uh, over in um, the Center for Biologics, they, uh, they wanted to get in on the game too, even more so. So they invented this specifically for their products, cells and tissues and gene therapies and all that kind of stuff. So this is like the breakthrough therapy designation for cells and gene therapies. Again, it has to be a serious condition. And in this case, it has its own guidance as well. So I commend you to that um, as, as you look for it. But um, this is likewise going to improve your valuation in the market, going to improve your, um, your speed time through, going to come with a lot of flowery language that the FDA promises you 
to love you even more than it loves everybody else. But um, in the reality, it has a map as well that goes along with it that you'll be able to follow to uh, hopefully get expedited review. So with that, any questions on breakthrough therapy designation? Have they come in, Dr. Freeman? Uh, yes. Um, what would be the definition of the earliest or the smallest amount of clinical information, clinical data needed for a breakthrough therapy? Well, the smallest amount is an N of one, right? So it's got to be clinical. Uh, it's conceivable that there are one. So if you were to treat somebody for ALS and with your new wizard drug and that person stood up and danced a jig, you can throw it in. Remember, when you apply for breakthrough therapy designation, you can always apply again. No harm, no foul, right? You don't get turned down for it and they consign you to the dungeon. They, they have to re-review your next application without... Um, prejudice, as we would say. So yes, um, I would say it depends on the quality of the data. But you know, there was, I think I was talking to somebody the other day about hereditary erotic aciduria, which is a, a drug that was approved, got, it's got its clinical approval based on four patients. So maybe somewhere between one and four. But um, remember, you can do this again. If things are just making your head spin about your drug, you would do it with smaller. If instead, after 10 patients, you've got data which really demonstrate that your product is much better than anything on the market, go for it. You're a little late. Yeah. Um, are most of the drugs with breakthrough therapy designation orphan drugs? Are most of the drugs with breakthrough therapy designation orphan? They are not all. Actually, I had that broken out in a separate table. I don't have those numbers right in front of me. So most means 50%. I hesitate to answer. The short answer is it can be, it is a mix of common disease and rare disease. These days, remember, half of everything FDA is approving is an orphan. So um, you can expect orphans to be well represented and probably over represented in the categories of patients that get breakthrough therapy designation. Remember, you have to demonstrate that your BT, your breakthrough therapy designation is better than what's out there. Most orphans have nothing. There's 7,000 rare diseases. We got yeah, maybe 400 of them covered by or the current uh, uh, stable of uh, a little over a thousand orphan drugs, maybe 400 diseases are covered by those. So there's a lot of room for innovation in orphans. And when you come in and there ain't nothing out there that's approved, it's pretty easy to prove that you're better than nothing. Um, with pharmacokinetic, et cetera, data in a phase zero trial with target effects, but not actually efficacy shown, have a chance to qualify? A snowball's chance in hell. Uh, probably not. I'm sorry to be a little bit uh, picturesque. I don't think so. This is about efficacy, okay? Now, don't worry. Uh, it could also be about safety. If you have got a new form of a, of a um, cancer drug that is completely non-toxic and still does the same work as another, that would be considered a breakthrough. But PK, not happening, okay? Not happening for PK. Just one more. One more. Oh, wait, we have a new one. Oh, okay. Um, because it's a subjective decision, does Big Pharma have the advantage over small and medium-sized companies? Guess what? Okay, I like this question. Because it's a subjective decision, does Big Pharma have an advantage? No, no. Uh, David smote Goliath, okay? And you can too, okay? You can too. So I would say no. In my humble opinion, large pharmaceutical companies make some of the most inane decisions and with the size of an organization, including the US government, grows its stupidity. But I really like tiny little companies that can be nimble and can think clearly. So no, little guys, you're on equal ground here. Next question. Um, have there been any correlates that have been found to, which uh, correspond to uh, application being successful in breakthrough therapy? Correlates for applications. No, the applications themselves are, oh, I wanted to mention this. I'm glad that you brought this up. So the short answer is no, there have been none found that I know of correlates because people aren't able to do analyses because the applications themselves in the main are not um, accessible to anybody. When you're doing this, you're at the IND stage. So virtually everything that you submit in 
is held secret. It's commercially confidential. You Nobody gets to know it. There's no list of the BTD applications. Although, if you look on the web, you'll see that CBER will provide aggregate data of how many people applied and how many were approved and how many were withdrawn and how many were denied. Uh, but each individual application, you can't actually look at. You can't really look at it. I will mention to you, by the way, that even the issuance of the breakthrough therapy designation itself, it'll be a letter and it'll come from the FDA um, and it'll be very nice and you'll go woohoo and you're going to be like drinking your champagne and all that and then you're going to realize FDA is not going to tell the world. You have to tell the world. So you can because you got your little FDA paper, you can put it up there on the web and say we got breakthrough therapy designation and you can tell your investors and tell all those people but FDA still considers the breakthrough therapy designation itself as commercially confidential because it's in the IND process. You are not yet an approved drug. So it can't tell the world right now. You will have to promote it to yourself, but most of us are pretty good at self-promotion. Okay, all right, we ready to go on? Oh, one more, one from in vivo, excellent. Uh, so you, you said for break, you have to show clinical like um, efficacy data that's better than existing uh, drugs out there. You have to, now, now you don't have to show, let's, let me rephrase it, you said, do you have to show clinical efficacy data that you're better than uh, an existing drug that's out there? No, you have to show promise. You have to show we have great promise. We are a breakthrough. You don't have to definitively demonstrate efficacy. You have to show wisps of efficacy. You have to, you have to sell the sizzle, if that makes sense, not the steak. Have you heard that before? Sell the sizzle, don't sell the steak. Well, the breakthrough therapy designation at that stage, you ain't got the data. You haven't got nailed down your efficacy. You've got, whoa, look what happened to Sally that I treated over there. That's so, so yes, but yes, you have to have that. You have to have something about efficacy. That's right. Your endpoint doesn't have to be the endpoint used in those uh, approved drugs. Or your clinical endpoint has to be clinically relevant, but it could be whatever. Remember, when the time that breakthrough therapy designation is coming, you're just getting going. You're just getting help. You're looking, FDA, can you give me some extra love? I got this tiny little thing and look how great it is. Please help me rise it up. That's what you're asking of FDA. And they're coming back to you and saying, we will designate you. Now, remember, you go on to uh, phase two and you poop the bed, okay? And you ain't got no good data. Guess what they do to that breakthrough therapy designation? pull it back, okay? They can do that and they do it all the time. They'll pull back your breakthrough therapy designation because you didn't work out in the, you're not so much of a breakthrough after all. So yes, you can have, and that doesn't necessarily mean, yet again, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to impact your progress through to the full marketing approval, which is what we all want because other than that, we can't make any money, right? Okay, any other questions? All right. Okay, one quick one and then we get it on the breakthrough here. Uh, PRV. Right, so the US company as well as ex US companies, right? The breakthrough uh, designation. I'm sorry? So does this breakthrough designation apply to? Yes, the, so the, the FDA breakthrough therapy designations, all of these things apply to both FDA and um, any company anywhere in the world can apply to FDA for breakthrough therapy designation. However, you are reminding me that I did not, in this preparation for this lecture and should have, talked about the prime designation. Anybody heard the prime? You've heard of prime, right? Yeah, and I probably should have brought this in. The EMA liked this idea too. They thought it was so cool. They said, hey, we need one of these for Europe, for the European authorities. That's the prime designation. And unfortunately, I didn't prepare any slides for that, but I just want to make everybody aware that just like uh, over there in Sieber, they said, oh, we need something for these special class of products. Um, over there in Europe, they said, this is really working. We need one over here for, for applicant sponsors to apply to your, for European uh, uh, approval. Okay, we're gonna go on to the next one because it's a, it's a, it's a difficult topic, um, but it's a cool, it's amazingly cool topic. The priority review vouchers. Before we talk about the priority review vouchers, let's just talk about priority review, okay? Priority review is something that we have had for decades, okay? It's been a long time. At the FDA, they've always known, you know, when it's time to decide on the marketing authorization, I'm talking about your NDA or your BLA, the, you know, end game, okay, end game. We're going to do the big review of the, that some deserved a little bit of priority and some should be a little bit more slow. Um, 
The PDUFA dates, now that we've codified these into the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, and we can talk about that later, I think we'll make that a whole separate topic, um, says that you know, a priority review is about six months and a regular, normal, everyday review is about 10 to 12 months. So at the FDA, they have had a system for decades, long before, they've had this system for uh, how we decide who gets to do it for six months and who gets to do it for 12 months. And um, it has to be a serious condition and you have to demonstrate the potential for a significant improvement over what's currently available. Um, but as you can imagine, if you are in the six month category for review, that has important economic implications compared to being in the 12 month category. Let's take, you've got a drug that you're thinking, wow, I'm gonna get $3 billion per year in sales for this blockbuster. Well, six months of sales is $1.5 billion. That's a lot of coin, okay? So it has value in and of itself. The priority review has value in and of itself. And so that's what priority review is. We've had priority review forever. We have regular rules about what kinds of drugs should get it and what kinds of drugs shouldn't get it. And now we're gonna change that. Watch this. These guys changed it, okay? This guy, David Ridley is a friend of mine from Duke. He's an economist and he dreamed this whole thing up. This guy is your typical California Democrat leftist guy. This guy is your right wing uh, Kansas Republican. And somehow the three of them all got together and they dreamed up this system for uh, a priority review voucher, a way to take that value of those six months and monetize it as an incentive for making the kinds of drugs that nobody gives a crap about, okay? But we want this as a society, we wanna make these kinds of drugs, but nobody seems to have any financial incentive. But maybe we could just somehow we could use arbitrage to use those six months and, and make that make that sort of sort of cool. So the basic problem is that there are drugs that we want as a society that nobody as an investor with money wants to put out money to go out and develop. These are drugs for tropical diseases. What's the problem here? Kids with worms in their belly don't have money to pay for drugs. Okay? Kids Without worms, you know, they have money, but it doesn't help. So people with, with worms don't have money, people without worms do have money. Um, and we need to find a way to incentivize the creation of drugs against those worms. Um, pediatric rare diseases, even though we've got the Orphan Drug Act, the feeling was that we still haven't got enough incentive for some of the rare pediatric rare diseases. And finally, drugs for the combat of the threat of bioterrorism is something that in this day and age, we think we need even more incentives for. So these came in three separate pieces of legislation. The first one was about 15 years ago, and the most recent one was maybe eight, maybe 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 six years ago, I think it was. So they have, um, they have evolved as everybody has got on the bandwagon of the priority review voucher. So here is the story of the priority review voucher. Behold, the Willy Wonka golden ticket. When you make one of these drugs that we as a society want, we of course will grant you marketing authorization because you've proven it's safe and, safe and effectiveness. And that means that you can sell it, right? But if you create a new drug for a worm, how are you gonna sell it in Kansas? You're not gonna sell it in Kansas. So nobody's gonna buy it there. So we will issue you not only the marketing authorization, we FDA, we will issue you this ticket, which you can sell. And it will entitle whoever buys it from you to put it on their application. And even if they're not entitled to a priority review, with this ticket, they get one. So we take that which is not a priority and we make it a priority, you get it? So that's why the thing has value. So it gives sponsors who make these drugs uh, of something that we want as a society, something that they can sell besides their drug. They, they can still sell their drug. By the way, their drug will already get a priority review because the system set up for these kinds of drugs that we want as a society, yeah, they'll get a priority review, but that's not enough of an incentive. So now we're gonna issue them this voucher that they can sell. So in addition to issuing market authorization, issue a fungible voucher entitling the bearer to a priority review regardless of the drug's particular and the voucher can be sold. So remember when, this is really kind of twisted, I know, but there are two companies that are involved in the priority review voucher. One that generates the voucher 
and one that uses the voucher, okay? The company that generates the voucher is typically tiny. It's, uh, it's the voucher itself, not the US sales that incentivize investment in the development of the drug and doing the clinical trials and everything. Their own drug will secure a priority review in its own right, and the PRV will be the product of the marketing authorization process. In fact, the, my earlier reference to hereditary erotic aciduria was for a pediatric drug. There were only 20 cases in the known world, and that was why that drug got developed, because a priority review voucher, and you're gonna see what these things are worth in just a moment. Um, the comp then there's the company that redeems the priority review. This is typically large, big pharma. They've got a drug that isn't eligible for a priority review, but it's a blockbuster. It's gonna generate all kinds of sales and we want to speed it up. So we wanna pay that small company for their voucher so we can get our non-priority drug through the FDA. I hope that this is clear, but I know it's a little twisted. I know, you know, there were, there were funny minds who invented this. Okay, these charts uh, tell the story a little bit better. Um, you can see here, these are the priority review vouchers here that were awarded in uh, gray green, and here's their consumption in, um, in black. Uh, you can see the prices here. This is how it happened. I'll never forget when this all happened. I didn't know what was gonna happen. It started off with 65,000, uh, excuse me, $65 million. Now we're talking about selling a little piece of paper. We're not talking about selling the drug. No, drugs we're used to selling for 65 million, 125 million, 245 million. It popped and peaked at $350 million was paid for this little Willy Wonka certificate. Now it's gone down since then, it's sort of stabilized. And the current prices, these are the prices of things that were publicly disclosed, is about $100 million. So people are do developing drugs specifically, not to get the pro drug product, because the drug product is economically non-viable. It's important if you've got the disease and you want it because you want to get better, but it's economically doesn't make any sense. But the companies that's developing it is getting the priority review voucher. Now the cost is that we have taken a system of prioritization and muddied that a little bit, right? We've made things that are not a priority. Now they are a priority because you have the priority review voucher so they get the six month review. I hope this all makes some sense. Okay, remember though, <clears throat> and we're starting to run out of time, that there are three types. Each of them has its own legislation and its own legislation has special quirks. So if you're looking to get a priority review, one of these, read the statute, okay? Go back and read the statute. Even a doctor can read a statute, true. Um, tropical diseases, okay? It has to be on one of the list and the list changes from time to time. They add things onto the list. Congress, by an act of Congress, actually it's the secretary of HHS, will add certain, uh, certain diseases like Ebola happened during this period and they added Ebola. Uh, there were other tropical diseases that have been added to the list as we've gone. The pediatric rare disease uh, priority review voucher, one of the important parts about that, that I wanna, rem and this actually came into occurrence when I was at the FDA, and the person who was writing the legislation asked me, said, what can we do to improve this voucher system that we're writing into law? And I said, well, you know, one thing the sponsors might like is if you had a process for designation uh, of this rare disease drug that showed that you'd be eligible for the PRV so that everybody would know at the end of the day. It has to be a drug that is primarily for peds, but wouldn't it be great if sponsors could document that the FDA says that if I get my marketing authorization, if I prove that it's safe and effective, I in fact will get this PRV, have that a priori rather than just wait until you know I've done everything and go get my NDA and at the end of the day, end of the review period, woohoo, I. I get the PRV, which is normally how it happens for these other two. So there is a special designation process. You can apply for documentation that you are eligible for that PRV if you have a rare, a pediatric rare disease. Okay? And lastly, the medical countermeasure has to fit into a specific definition of what a medical countermeasure is. And that's all in the statute as well. So I can, can I send you back to there. This has to be a, I should have written this all out, a new chemical entity. You have to have a brand new drug. So there's a lot of other places, and someday we'll do a talk on uh, meta repurposing, where a 505B2 process would work, but not in this one. Okay, this gotta be something brand new. Okay, it's gotta be a new, a, a new molecule in order to get one of these. And lastly, <clears throat> you don't need to apply, even though there is a designation process for the pediatric rare disease priority review voucher that you can apply, it's optional. Um, you don't have to, you just, um, 
Your PRV is issued right along with your marketing authorization. They'll grant it to you and you can go out and sell it. How cool is that? Okay, so that's the PRV and we'll take any questions on the PRV. Dr. Freeman, you got more questions? Um, there's some new questions in right now, but I have a question myself. You do? Yes. Oh, please. Did the Duke Economist anticipate the sales of the priority review voucher? Yes, so the Duke Economist published this in, um, <clears throat> he published this in a article in Health Affairs. And in fact, that's how this began. An academic published an article and then some, um, some senators and congressmen uh, took a liking to it, took a shine to it and decided, hey, this is a cool idea and approached him about it. In that, he, um, he laid out his thinking about the, the value of priority review and how we could create this voucher. And he tried to estimate what he thought this voucher would be worth. He thought it was worth $600 million in this article. He was wrong, he was wrong, but that's what he thought because he thought based on First to market advantage would be one thing that in addition to just the raw uh, sales itself, but the first to market is a big deal uh, for these pharmaceutical companies. So he thought it was worth about that much. Um, he has made a whole career now, as you might expect after all this, David, on um, the priority review voucher. It's still a very active area uh, of interest and it's not worth $600 million. <clears throat> we didn't know. I thought maybe it would go up that high when I saw it screaming up to $300 million, but now it's pretty stabilized at, uh, at 100. Please. Cap on these? Does, does Congress cap the number that they'll? Is there a cap on what? The number that they grant. The number that they grant. There is not a cap on the number that they grant. There's also not a cap if you happen to have. There was a recent question that came up. If you happen to have a um, a drug that would qualify for a priority review voucher because it's both tropical and a pediatric rare disease or and a medical kind, you get two for one drug. How about that? They've decided. They've made this uh, this determination. I don't think that's a, a particular example that I could cite. Maybe it did happen, but I don't think. I know that the question has come up, and it has been answered that yes, because they are separate pieces of legislation. There is not a cap on it, and I think that we are starting to see in the reflected in the prices for the priority review vouchers some PRV flation. You know that as we print this money um, by issuing them, their value as a total, each one goes down by some. So it, it's a good question, but uh, no, there's no cap on that. However, I will also say um, the legislation for the uh, tropical one is permanent. It just said, thou shalt. The legislation for the pediatric one, and I believe for the for the medical countermeasures one, although I'm happy to accept correction on that, but I'm certain for the for the pediatric one has to be renewed every five years or so, every certain number of years, and it's gone through at least one or two review re renewal cycles. The um, the uh, uh, patient groups who are supportive of that pediatric rare disease priority review voucher have been um, vociferous in its defense. And so it has been renewed each time. So, so no, there isn't a cap. But oh, maybe you're leading to something with that. Uh, well, I, you know, you could make the argument that if somebody decided that you know they found 50 pediatric rare diseases that they had a platform they could treat, they could put in for 50 vouchers. Well, remember, um, they have to have pro market authorization for each product has to be an NCE for its first indication issues a, a voucher. Okay, so if one drug has the next 49 indications would not issue 49 um, uh, vouchers. It only gets one voucher per drug because it has to be a new chemical entity. That's where I was going with the power of these platforms and the libraries that generate. Yeah, yeah, well platforms, um, Platforms are not a regulatory term. They are everything. They're everything around here for sure. But um, they, it, it's, it's about the particular drug. And one famous uh, FDA lawyer once told me that 90% of drug laws, what's the same and what's different? You know, that's, that's, that's what it's all about there. Uh, it's one particular drug and one particular disease. Is there an, oh, I'm sorry, please. Please. So in the uh, oncology world, we have examples of, very large companies, but not surprisingly, having shorter than six months review. Is there a way to forecast that or? Shorter than six months review. That would be unusual. It would be highly unusual that it would be that quick. But a priority review is not required to be up to six months. It could go faster than that. It's true. 
And particularly if it's a very large company that is extremely well prepared and its regulatory dossier is quite complete. But again, that would be a, um, I, I, what we generally think about as review times are issued under the PDUFA rules, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act rules. And they are priority or normal, uh, regular review times. And, and the regular review times are 10 to 12. The priority is set to be, again, these are all no later thans. So if the agency is all jazzed up about something, then uh, the best way to do that is get the agency all jazzed up about your drug. So other questions? Anything coming in? Oh, go ahead. Um, the See, we're giving priority to everybody in the room. So come here next month. Go ahead. Uh, how many times can the vouchers be sold? Like oh, how many times can the vouchers be sold? That's an excellent question. When the first thing came up, um, the tropical disease one, um, Congress said, in its infinite wisdom, the drug can be sold. But Congress didn't say the drug can be, um, excuse me, the voucher can be sold. I, I misspoke. The voucher can be sold. Congress didn't say the voucher can be resold. Now, in the later um, pieces of legend, and this caused all kinds of conniptions amongst the lawyers because they said, well, they didn't provide the enabling legislation. Now, the good news is businessmen are generally smarter than lawyers. And so they were able to come up with all kinds of schemes by which things are held in trust and this and that and the other thing. I, I, I don't know. These transactions can happen. Uh, so they figured out ways around that. And, and they, they fought over the tropical disease one for the longest time. I think that they may have relented and said, okay, it's a free market. The later pieces of legislation for pediatric and for... Um, and for medical countermeasures, they, re, they wrote the statute to say that it could be, in fact, resold and sold and resold. In fact, when they came to me saying, how could we improve upon the tropical thing? I said, well, make, let's clarify this, because the lawyers all have their knickers in a knot over this thing. Uh, so yes, it can be uh, uh, resold. OK? Other questions? For the rare pediatrics. You can put it up on eBay now, OK? <laughs> yes? The rare pediatric, pediatric voucher, is there a metric that determines what is primarily for pediatrics? Okay, so the, the question is about the criteria for the rare pediatric disease priority review voucher or the designation, actually, which you can get. The only one of the three that you can get a designation for. You can get a designation for that one saying, yeah, they're entitled me to. And what is the metric? Well, this has been in evolution. Uh, when it first started out, when uh, not when I was at the agency, because I think I'd already left the agency by then, but it, uh, it was first reviewed exclusively by the Office of Orphan Products, which I used to head. And they did a very strict um, epidemiologic assessment as to whether it is a pediatric drug or not. And they came out with some interesting answers that people did not like. For example, I don't know if you knew this, but there are a lot of adults living around with muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy is a pediatric disease. It's diagnosed in children. It's a disease of, it's a congenital disease. And I'm talking about Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. There are many different kinds. Um, it's, it's a pediatric disease. And so people did not, um, did not appreciate that. And so later, uh, the review process was changed to bring in the Office of Pediatric Therapies, the sister uh, office right beside organizationally. When we talk about the, uh, the anatomy and physiology of FDA, the organism dissected. That's one of my talks I'll be doing later a month. You'll, you'll hear about that, about how these little bodies and little, little offices work together. They decided to get together to jointly uh, evaluate pediatric rare disease priority review voucher designation uh, applications. Uh, and it's been a lot more liberal in its interpretation. So uh, the short answer is there used to be a very strict uh, epidemiologic looking at the question of prevalence and are 51% of them under 18 versus over 18. Per, uh, there used to be that. And that is no longer the case because, uh, oh, the other one is sickle cell. Hello, sickle cell. We got so many adults living with sickle cell right now, but it's a pediatric disease. It's clearly starts in children and, and so on. That one, in fact, has been uh, recognized now and is eligible for the voucher. So um, it has been a dynamic situation is the short answer. Other questions from the, uh... no. well, well, listen, everybody, this has been an hour. It's been a fun hour. I look forward to it every month. Preparing for it is a little bit of work, but, uh, but it's cool. So um, I hope you've enjoyed it. We're gonna have everything on tape. If you wanna see one of our older ones, oh, wait, I think I have, I have more slides, that's right.
Okay, so in review, um, breakthrough therapy designation is your special gold star from the FDA. Um, it's subjective yet auspicious if you're designated. So get it, and you won't get it if you don't apply. Uh, the priority review voucher, you can make some serious cash if you are responding to these social needs. So think about, uh, think about those drugs that nobody really wants to make. Our next event, oh, I still have the X's. What date is it, November? 18th. November 18th, I'm sorry that it's not up there. November 18th, um, it's gonna be Perk Up for Perks Part Two. We're gonna talk about uh, clinical endpoints and accelerated approval and, um, and fast track as well. Um, easy expediency and it sounds nice too. So uh, that's what we'll do on part two. Uh, just so you know, part uh, the, the next steps for November Our one for December is, I just mentioned already, it's gonna be uh, FDA anatomy and physiology, the organism dissected. And then in January, what are we doing in January? Oh, uses and abuses of epidemiology in orphan drugs. So we're gonna talk about that too. So with that, I thank you all so much. Thanks for coming. Those of you who came, and those of you who are out there and said you were coming and didn't come, come next time. We bought you cookies. Come, all right? Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. Are we done? Are we still live? Okay.